Welcome to the second video on translational motion. This one is all about momentum and it builds really heavily on what we learned last year. So I'm going to do a recap of the very important parts we need to know. So starting off with the two key formula we learned last year. This bottom one here is called impulse momentum. This one here means the change in momentum comes from a force over a period of time. So a change in momentum, for example, could be a volleyball. It's coming straight at you, so you change its momentum by hitting it back. You can apply a force for some period of time and the volleyball will turn right around. This is the impulse formula. Now, more importantly, possibly, is the formula for momentum. That's P, and that equals the mass times velocity. So I'm gonna run through a few quick examples of things which we did last year, and then we're gonna move on and build on that for what we do at level three. So last year, you might get the kind of question with momentum where you have two balls, uh, they're gonna to collide together, they're both 150 grams or 0.15 kgs, and number seven is moving towards the stationary ball number three. And it says here, there is an impulse, which means a change in momentum of 0.25 newtons per second. Can we calculate how fast the stationary number three is gonna move after number seven collides with it? So to do that, let's write down what we have. We have an impulse, a change in momentum of 0.25. We've got a mass of 0.15 down here. We want to find the velocity, how fast it's going. So momentum, mass, and velocity are all taken up in this top formula here, P equals MV. If we rearrange that for velocity, we're gonna get velocity equals momentum divided by mass. Plug in our numbers, and we're gonna get a final velocity of 1.67 meters per second. So this is how we use the momentum formula. I've just done a very brief overview. So if you're uncertain about any of this, I'd highly recommend going and seeing the level two physics videos on momentum part two. It covers these formulas in much more detail. Now the second important thing from level two is following on from this momentum. It's that momentum is conserved in a collision as long as no external forces are acting. So you would have seen some kind of question like this. A car crashes into a truck, they lock together and they move off together. Now we need to calculate the velocity after the collision. Knowing that momentum is mass times velocity, we can get the momentum of this car here on the left. So 800 kgs times 10 meters per second is a momentum of 8,000. With the truck, we've got 2,000 times one is a momentum of 2,000. So before they collide, we've got a total momentum of 10,000. Now that means that after they collide, because momentum is conserved, there's also gonna be a momentum of 10,000. So we can use this and their combined mass of 800 kgs plus 2,000 kgs, which we've got here, to calculate the velocity using P equals MV, or again, rearrange to V equals momentum over mass. So if we did put momentum of 10,000 divided by 2,800 in, we'd get a final velocity of 3.57 meters per second. Again, this is all stuff which was covered last year, but it's really important you understand it because we're about to build on it. If you're not sure, go and see the level two physics mechanics video called Momentum Part One. So building on that knowledge in level three, we use the exact same concepts. So momentum is mass times velocity, and that momentum is still conserved in a collision. But if you imagine here, we've still got a blue car crashing into a red truck, they have the same speed and the same mass that they used to, but now they're going in different directions. So it's a two dimensional problem rather than just a one dimensional problem. This is the difference. So how do we solve that kind of thing? Well, first of all, let's get rid of the pictures to make it as simple as possible. And you're gonna have two arrows going in two different directions like this. What you need to do is add the arrows together head to tail. So head to tail means that you take the head of one of the arrows, so that means the pointy part here, and you join it with the tail of the other arrow. So that's the very start of the arrow. So I'm gonna take this one on the right here, move it over to the left, so we've got the big car's momentum, and then we've got the truck's momentum. So it's joined together the head of the car to the tail of the truck. So that is how we add together these momentum vectors. These arrows are called vectors. Now from the very start, the first tail, to the very end, the final head, you join together as one arrow and that is your final momentum. So to calculate this though, we can no longer just add together the 8,000 plus the 2,000. Because they're on different angles, we have to use Pythagoras. 
Now, you'll notice, as tends to happen in your exams, that they'll almost always be at 90 degrees. So you can use Pythagoras and you can use Sokotoa or trigonometry. So calculating this log n for this specific example, then we've got a squared plus b squared equals c squared. You plug that into your formula, you're going to get a final length here of 8,246 kilogram meters per second for your momentum. But another thing that comes in with two dimensions now is it's not just the size of the arrow, how long it is, it's also the direction of the arrow. So to find out this angle here, we know right from the start that the total angle was 60. So we can find this little angle inside the triangle to figure out our final angle. So if we find this angle in here, we're going to use Sokotoa. So it's going to be tan because we've got the adjacent side and the opposite side. And if we rearrange this one to find angle, we're going to get an angle of 14 degrees. Now, if you've got 14 degrees inside here and a total angle of 60, that must mean there's 46 degrees outside. So using all of our trigonometry, and this is a hard excellence level question, by the way, so just try and keep up with what's going on. So your momentum before they collide, because you've added their two momentums beforehand, is 8,246, 46 degrees above the horizontal. Now that is gonna be the exact same as your momentum afterwards. So if you got the same question and you needed to calculate velocity, again, you could rearrange this momentum equals mass times velocity formula into velocity equals momentum over mass. Plug in your numbers of your momentum and your total mass and you'd get your final velocity of 2.95 meters per second. So this is how we take the one dimensional problems from last year and turn them into two dimensional problems by adding the two vectors together and using trigonometry to find our answers. But it's still momentum before equals momentum afterwards. So here's what you need to know from this video. You need to know these two formulas from last year, your impulse formula and your momentum formula. It's now a two dimensional collision problem when you get momentum. So momentum is still conserved and it's still assuming there's no external forces acting. But now you've got to worry about the angles. It's almost always going to be on an angle of 90 degrees. So it's head to tail. The head or the arrow of one arrow gets pointed onto the back end of the other arrow. So that's head to tail method. Then from the very start to the very end is your final amount. You're going to have to use Pythagoras and Sokotoa to figure out these lengths and these angles. And any of these have a size, which is the length of the arrow, that's the 8,000 number here, and a direction, which is an angle, so you'll need to calculate. Let's try a question now. In the previous video, we saw this question on disks. We've got disk A moving across at 1.21 meters per second with a mass hitting stationary disk B. And we calculated that the speed of the center of mass was 0.521 meters per second. Now, following on from that, the two disks collide with one another. Now, we need to determine the size and the momentum of disk a after that collision. And here we've got a velocity for disk B, which is 0.365 meters per second. The other thing we know is that the velocity of the center of mass, which is the combined system, is 0.521 meters per second, what we calculated last time. So move that all across to the left so we can work out some space. The key things we learned is that we're gonna add these vectors together head to tail. We're gonna use Pythagoras and Sokotoa trigonometry in a right angle triangle. And we're going to use our formula, momentum equals mass times velocity. So to find the momentum of A, this momentum of this disk here, we're going to add it to the momentum for B. It's going to be on a right angle, and it's shown by the right angle in here. And those two together make the total momentum. So that's what we've figured out. So to put down what we know now, for B, we know a mass and we know a velocity. So mass times velocity, which gives us the momentum for B, would be 0.25 kilogram meters per second mass times velocity. Now in the same way, we have a total mass and an overall center of mass velocity. So we can put that down for the total. So the total mass is gonna to add together to be 1.201 kgs multiplied by the velocity of the center of mass, 0.521 meters per second. That gives us a total momentum of 0.626 kilogram meters per second. So now that we know these, we can use Pythagoras to find out the momentum for A. So we have Pythagoras that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Now we're going to have to rearrange it because we're now finding a shorter side to get A squared equals C squared minus B squared. 
So plugging in C squared our long side, we've got 0 0.626 squared minus 0 0.25 squared is going to give us 0 0.329. We square root both sides, and that gives us a final momentum of 0 0.573 kilogram meters per second. So now we have found the momentum of A after the collision. But let's do one more question before we finish. Here we've got these discs and they carry on sliding until this cord gets fully extended. Now then, we need to know what happens to them after they do, they're going to ping back together. So by considering these forces that are acting on the discs, we need to explain why the momentum of the system has to be conserved. So let's look at the only force formula we know for momentum. So here we've got momentum, there's a force, is going to change. Now let's think about that. The system doesn't have any external forces acting. Now there's going to be internal forces, so the cord is going to ping these discs back together again, but there are no external forces. There's no friction going from outside, there's nobody coming in and hitting one of the discs one way or another. So therefore we can answer that the only forces will be acting is the tension force in the cord. And because this is an internal force, neither the momentum of the system or the velocity of the center of the mass, none of that stuff is going to change. On top of this, you don't just have to say that it's only internal forces, you can say there's no external forces, there's no friction, nothing is changing externally, therefore momentum is conserved. So this is how we do momentum questions at level three, and they're almost all two-dimensional.